Section 11, Part 1 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Carroll. The Empire of Business, Section 11, Wealth, Part 1. When President Roosevelt sent his notable message to Congress seven years ago, calling attention to the unequal distribution of wealth and recommending high progressive taxes upon estates at the death of the owners, the writer sent him a copy of The Gospel of Wealth. The president wrote in reply that he was, quote, greatly struck with the fact that 17 years ago you had it all, end quote. This led the writer to proceed a step further and add another chapter which appeared in 1906. In like manner, the writer held and expressed advanced views upon labor and land before he could be ranked as one of the multimillionaires. He cannot therefore be regarded as only a recent convert to some of the doctrines which are now promulgated so freely. As time has only served to confirm the views then expressed, it is believed that readers will prefer to learn what was written before these questions had come so prominently to the front. The unequal distribution of wealth lies at the root of the present socialistic activity. This is no surprise to the writer. It was bound to force itself to the front, because exhibiting extremes unknown before, it has become one of the crying evils of our day. In the world's progress, scientific discoverers and mechanical inventors appeared and adapted the forces and materials of nature to the uses of man, followed by the commercial and industrial age in which we live in which wealth has been produced as if by magic, and fallen largely to the captains of industry, greatly to their own surprise. Multimillionaires, a new genus, have appeared, laden with fortunes of such magnitude as the past knew nothing of. The extremes in the distribution of wealth have never been so great as they are today, although salaries and wages have never been so high. This has naturally attracted the attention of the wage earners, and others not deluged by the golden showers, and the socialist budget appears as one of the remedies proposed. In the Gospel of Wealth, 1889, the writer advocated graduated taxation upon estates at death of owners, saying, The growing disposition to tax more and more heavily large estates left at death is a cheering indication of the growth of a salutary change in public opinion. The state of Pennsylvania now takes, subject to some exceptions, one-tenth of the property left by its citizens. The budget presented in the British Parliament the other day proposes to increase the death duties and, most significant of all, the new tax is to be graduated. Of all forms of taxation, this seems the wisest. Men who continue hoarding great sums all their lives, the proper use of which for public ends would work good to the community from which it chiefly came, should be made to feel that the community in the form of the state cannot thus be deprived of its proper share. By taxing estates heavily at death, the state marks its condemnation of the selfish millionaire's unworthy life. It is desirable that nations should go much further in this direction. Indeed, it is difficult to set bounds to the share of a rich man's estate which should go at his death to the public through the agency of the state. And by all means, such taxes should be graduated, beginning at nothing upon moderate sums to dependents, and increasing rapidly as the amounts swell, until of the millionaire's hoard, as of Shylock's at least, the other half comes to the privy coffer of the state. This policy would work powerfully to induce the rich man to attend to the administration of wealth during his life, which is the end that society should always have in view as being by far the most fruitful for the people. Nor need it be feared that this policy would sap the root of enterprise and render men less anxious to accumulate. For, to the class whose ambition it is to leave great fortunes and be talked about after death, it will be even more attractive and indeed a somewhat nobler ambition to have enormous sums paid over to the state from their fortunes. Long entertaining such views, there is nothing in the socialist budget, as presented by Mr. Snowden in the Labor Ideal series, which does not commend itself to the writer. It will be noticed, it proposes, as the Gospel of Wealth did 19 years ago, that one half of the deceased millionaire's hoard should go to the state 
when the estate exceeds $5 million. Mr. Snowden's protest against indirect taxation of commodities is also sound because this favors the rich. One individual does not consume much more of these than another, while the ability of the rich to pay duties is infinitely greater than that of the masses. The American, British, and German tariffs present a great contrast, much to the benefit of the masses of the American people, and this although America, like Germany, is protective and Britain is free trade. America taxes imports heavily, but these are the luxuries of the rich, which the masses do not consume. The American masses eat, wear, drink, smoke American products. Only the rich wear foreign silks, linens, fine cottons, broadcloths, etc., drink French wines, or smoke Havana tobacco. It is by taxing the importation of these and similar articles that America raises revenue. Thus, in 1907, $216 million was collected upon such luxuries, all paid by the rich who alone use them. Tea, chocolate, and coffee are free. Sugar, formerly free, alone of all food products, yields much revenue, as a protective duty of two cents per pound exists upon it at present, intended to stimulate the growth of beets. Half a million tons of domestic sugar were produced in 1906, and production is rapidly increasing. Thus, the American workman, if he neither smoke nor drink, practically escapes tariff duties, except upon sugar. In Britain, the workman pays not only upon sugar, but also upon imported tobacco, tea, and coffee. The American excise tax upon tobacco is only six cents per pound as compared with 75 cents in Britain. Germany in 1905 imported articles for consumption valued at $595 million. To protect her agriculturalists, she taxes all imported food products, which are consumed by rich and poor alike. The German masses are here more heavily taxed than the British. The distribution of wealth and taxation in Britain, according to Mulhall and later authorities, is estimated as follows. See Westminster Review, February 1908, page 172. 680,000 persons in the rich class, with a combined wealth of $60 billion and $190 million in tax collected. 5,100,000 persons in the middle class, with a combined wealth of $15 billion and $210 million in tax collected. 38,220,000 persons in the working class, with a combined wealth of $5 billion and $200 million in tax collected. The total number of persons is 44 million, with a combined wealth of $80 billion and $600 million in total tax collected. This result is obtained by a combination of imposts, which, taken collectively, tax the different classes of the people on the average in proportion to their income or wages. But if an assessment were made, as it should be, in proportion to accumulated wealth, the figures would appear as follows. Rich class, with a combined wealth of $60 billion and $450 million tax. Middle class, with a combined wealth of $15 billion and $112,500,000 tax. Working class, with a combined wealth of $5 billion and $37,500,000 tax. The total wealth is $80 billion with $600 million in total tax. From this it would seem that the middle class are charged $97,500,000 above their proper share, and the working class pay $162,500,000 too much, while the rich contribute $260 million less than they should do in proportion to the wealth of their real and personal estate. In other words, about 1.5% of the whole population own the bulk of the wealth, and the rest of the community pay the bulk of the taxes. The statement appears almost incredible, but the matter is of such importance as to be worthy of official inquiry. Those whose incomes are only sufficient to meet physical wants should not be subjected to taxation at all. Adam Smith's dictum, the subjects of every state ought to contribute to the support of government as nearly as possible in proportion to their respective abilities. 
that is, in proportion to the revenue which they respectively enjoy under the protection of state, should be the rule, especially since there is so much wealth concentrated in the richer classes beyond their most liberal needs. We speak, however, only of the physical needs of men. It should always be remembered by the working man that neither liquor nor tobacco can be considered as needs. The dire consequences resulting from the use of liquor would justify much higher taxation upon it in the interest of the workers themselves. The greatest single evil in Britain today is intemperance. $785 million yearly is the drink bill. How much of this is paid by the working class is, we believe, unknown, but even if it be only one half, here is 392 and a half millions worse than wasted by them. The liquor interests have now received title to their drinking places, when before they had only licenses from year to year, a present made to them, as estimated by some, equal to $1,500 million. When one asks himself what would most benefit the worker, there is no hesitation in the reply, to avoid liquor and gambling. The working man who indulges in either is, to the extent he does so, the architect of his own poverty. Here is the issue of greatest moment to the working men. One cannot help those who do not help themselves. One man cannot push another up a ladder. The moment he realizes his grasp, the assisted one falls. It is only possible to really help those who cooperate with the helper. It is not the submerged but the swimming tenth that can be steadily and rapidly improved by the aid of their fellows. The former should be the special care of the state and should be isolated. Viewing socialism upon its financial side, as shown in Mr. Snowden's budget, its demands are just. A heavy progressive tax upon wealth at death of owner is not only desirable, it is strictly just. So is it just to exempt from taxation the minimum amount necessary to supply the physical wants of men and their families, just as a minimum is exempt from income tax in Britain and the modest homestead is from foreclosure under mortgage in America. There is, however, nothing specially socialistic in this. It is sound Adam Smith doctrine that all should pay taxes only in proportion to their ability to do so, and revolutionary socialism is successfully to be combated only by properly conceding the just claims of moderate men. Wealth is undoubtedly a great factor in civilized life, a very great factor indeed since civilization itself rests upon it as its foundation. In his essay upon the gospel of wealth in the 19th century, Mr. Gladstone pronounced it to be the business of the world. When there was no wealth, there was no civilization. None was possible. All was necessarily savage or barbaric. As long as the first stage existed, and man consumed all that he captured, nothing permanent could be built, there being no reserve fund to draw upon. Man lived in the wilderness, almost as he found it, sheltering himself in huts made of branches or in caves. During the second stage, faint traces of individualism began to appear. In the progress of the race, men displayed different aptitudes. One man could forge swords and make arrows better than another. One could capture more fish, another kill more game, and finally it became profitable for these to apply themselves solely to their respective branches. Specialization began the root of individualism, then became exchange of products, but after a time barter ceased, and certain articles, wampum, beads, skins, shells, became money in which were invested the savings of men. Then was slowly developed in due progress of time that beneficent gospel, as a man soweth, so he reap, reward, according to service. Many things hitherto held in common became private property, and at last, out of the savings of men, capital, durable things were built, and civilization dawned. Even in our own time, not a ton nor a yard of anything can be produced, not a ship nor railroad, not a house, school, university, nor church built, without drawing upon stored-up capital, which is wealth. At first, for a short period, all was the savings of manual labor, but very soon wealth came in much larger amounts due to individuals from various sources, increased value of land, 
minerals, etc., and then of real estate, new inventions, etc. Thus, wealth is not all the result of manual labor, though the first small surplus was. The greatest growth of wealth from any one source in our times comes from the increased value of real estate upon which little or no labor is bestowed, the increase of population raising the values. According to Macpherson, author of Carlyle and Adam Smith, in the famous Scots series, we have to charge the greatest of economists, Adam Smith himself, with having made a slip to the effect that the wealth of a nation is the creation of labor, out of which sprang the other error that labor is the measure of the exchangeable value of commodities. Marx took up these mistaken ideas and justly decided that they led to the conclusion that capitalistic profit is simply the surplus value obtained from unpaid labor. In extenuation of Smith's slip, it should be remembered that in his day, our system of gigantic production in huge establishments had not begun. People generally labored in their own homes and wealth accumulated slowly. All is changed and Marx's theory is abandoned by the leading socialists today who reject his special contributions to pure economics. His theory of value meets with little support. But the great mass of socialistic workingmen have not yet reached this stage. Still, the error, having been wounded, must soon die among its worshippers, as error always does. It is easily demonstrated to be an error. For instance, the greatest increase of any single department in wealth arises from increased value of land. The rateable value of the City of London in 1870 was £2,266,842, or $11,334,210, and is now five million four hundred fifty one thousand eight hundred and twenty pounds or twenty seven million two hundred and fifty nine thousand one hundred dollars the corresponding figures for the whole metropolis are eighteen million seven hundred and nineteen thousand two hundred and thirty seven pounds or ninety three million five hundred and ninety six thousand one hundred and eighty five dollars and forty four million three hundred and fifty one thousand pounds or $221,755,000. The valuation of New York City has increased from $4,751,532,826 in 1903 to $6,240,480,602 in 1907. In the whole of the United States, as quoted elsewhere, the census shows that from 1890 to 1900, the value of real estate increased from $39,544,544,333 to $52,537,628,164, an increase of $12,993,000,000. $831, three and a half times the national debt of Britain. It is clear that wealth mainly created by increase of population is not to be credited to labor, for little additional labor was expended. The labor of tilling the soil was compensated for by the crops and did not add to the valuation. That value depends upon and is the result of labor can be exploded thus. The late Duke Sutherland, in his praiseworthy desire to improve conditions upon his vast highland estates by making the land support his people at home, expended for years the labor of many men and vast sums in the effort. Few dollars of value were created. The effort failed. Chantry spends a year upon a statue, and it brings $5,000. Another man works twice as long and twice as hard, yet his statue is practically worthless. Both labored, but purchasers wanted the one statue and did not want the other. Thus, the wants of the purchaser and not the labor expended fix his value. So with all forms of labor. If there be a demand, i.e. a purchaser, for it at a certain price, for price is a potent factor, what labor produces has value. If not, Labor expended 
is labor lost. The result is that labor is not employed upon articles not in demand. Thus, labor neither creates nor fixes value. The law of supply and demand does so. The employer engaged in manufacturing is compelled to meet the wants of the people, his customers. The interest of the employer and employee, capital and labor, in doing so are mutual, not antagonistic. Marx predicted that machinery would extend the hours of labor and depress wages so much that he foresaw the time when employers would get the labor of a whole family for what they had paid for the head alone. He denied that any share of increased profits could fall to the workers so long as capital had control of machinery. The reverse of all this has been the result. Hours of labor have been reduced, wages increased, and a great advance has been made in the position of wage earners under the new conditions of production. The proofs of this gratifying result, especially during the past 20 years, are among the most welcome evidences the optimistic well-wisher of the working class receives that all goes well, though not quite so fast as we and other reformers most ardently wish. After making full allowance for differences in men, it still remains true that contrasts in their wealth are infinitely greater than those existing between them in their different qualities, abilities, education, and except the supreme few, their contributions to the world's work. It should be remembered always that wealth is not chiefly the product of the individual under present conditions, but largely the joint product of the community. Let us go to the root of the matter and inquire how fortunes are created whence and how they arise. This the writer has recently attempted to do in the following manner. Imagine an honest, hard-working farmer who finds himself able to give each of his two sons a farm. They have married admirable young women of the neighborhood, of good kith and kin, friends from youth, no mistakes about their virtues. The sons find farms, one in the center of Manhattan Island, the other beyond the Harlem. They cast lots for the farms as the fairest method, thus letting the fates decide. Neither has a preference. The Harlem farm falls to the elder, the Manhattan to the younger. Mark now the problem of wealth, how it develops. A few hundred dollars buys the farms, and the loving brothers set out for themselves. They are respected by all, loved by their intimates. To the extent of their means, they are liberal contributors to all good causes and especially to the relief of neighbors who through exceptional troubles need friendly aid and counsel. They are equally industrious, cultivate their farms equally well, and in every respect are equally good citizens of the state. Their children grow up and are educated together. The growth of New York City northward soon makes the children of the younger millionaires, while those of the elder remain simple farmers in comfortable circumstances, but fortunate in this beyond their cousins, still of the class who have to perform some service to their fellows and thus earn a livelihood. Now, who or what made this difference in wealth? Not labor, not skill, no, nor superior ability, sagacity, nor enterprise, nor greater public service. The community created the millionaire's wealth. While he slept, it grew as fast as when he was awake. It would have arisen exactly as it did had he been on the Harlem and his brother been on the Manhattan farm. The younger farmer, now a greater property holder, dies, and his children in due time pass away, each leaving millions since the farm has been part of the great city and immense buildings upon it produce annual rents of hundreds of thousands of dollars. When these children die, who have neither toiled nor spun, what canon of justice would be violated were the nation to step in and say that since the aggregation of their fellow men called the community created the descendants' wealth, it is entitled to a large portion of it as they pass away. The community has refrained from exacting any part during their lives. The heirs have been allowed to enjoy it all, because although in their case the wealth was a purely communal growth, yet in other cases wealth often comes largely from individual effort and ability, and hence it is better for the community to allow such ability to remain in charge of fortune-making, because more likely to succeed 
and in doing so develop our country's resources. It would be unwise to interfere with the working bees. Better allow them to continue gathering honey during their lives. When they die, the nation should have a large portion of the honey remaining in the hives. It is immaterial at what date collection is made so that it comes to the national treasury at last. That by far the greatest amount of wealth created in any branch comes from enhanced values of real property is especially true in a prosperous country, increasing rapidly in population like the United States. The census shows that from 1890 to 1900, the value of real estate increased from $39,544,544,333 to $52,000,000,000. Five hundred thirty seven million six hundred twenty eight thousand one hundred and sixty four dollars, an increase of twelve billion nine hundred ninety three million eighty three thousand eight hundred thirty one dollars, one billion three hundred million dollars per year, over three million five hundred thousand dollars per day. The obvious creator of this wealth is not the individual, but the community as we see in the case of the two brother farmers. Property may pass through many proprietors, each paying more for it than his predecessor, but whether each succeeding owner sells to his successor at a profit depends almost solely upon whether the surrounding population increases. Let population remain stationary, and so does values of property. Let it decline and values fall even more rapidly. In other words, increased population, the community, increases the wealth in each successive generation. Decrease of population reduces it, and this law holds in the whole of that vast and greatest field of wealth, real estate. In no other field is the making of wealth so greatly dependent upon the community, so little upon the owner, who may wholly neglect it without injury. Therefore, no other form of wealth should contribute to the nation so generously. Let us now trace the acquisition of wealth by the active businessman who has some personal part, and often not a small one, in creating it. Imagine five brothers, sons of another hard-working farmer. The first settles in New York City, the second in Pittsburgh, the third in Chicago, and the fourth in Montana. The first sees that railroads in every direction are essential to the coming metropolis, devotes himself to this field, and obtains large interests therein. As the population of the country increases, and that of New York City bounds ahead into the millions, these lines of transport laden with traffic justify increasing bonded debt. Having the figures under his eye, he sees that the shares of these railways are sure to become dividend-paying, that even already there are surplus earnings beyond the bonded interest, which, if not needed for pressing extensions, could be paid in dividends and make the stock par. He strains his credit, borrows great sums, buys the shares when prices are low, and floating upon a tidal wave of swelling prosperity caused by the increased traffic of rapidly increasing communities, he soon becomes a multimillionaire. And at his death, his children are all left millionaires. In the consolidation of the various short lines into one great whole, there was margin for a stupendous increase of capital. And in other collateral fields, there lay numerous opportunities for profitable exploitation. All, however, depended upon an expanding population for increased values. Now, while the founder of the family must be credited with remarkable ability, and with having done the state some service in his day and generation, it cannot be denied that the chief creators of his wealth were the increasing communities along the railroads, which gave the traffic that lifted those lines into dividend payers upon a capital far beyond their actual cost. In the work and its profits, the nation was an essential partner, and is equally entitled with the individual to share in the dividends. The second son is so fortunate as to settle in Pittsburgh when it had been just discovered that some of the coal fields of which it is the center produced a coking coal admirably adapted for iron ore smelting. Another vein easily mined proved a splendid steam coal. Small iron mills soon sprang up. 
Everything indicated that here indeed was the future Iron City, where steel could be produced more cheaply than any other location in the world. Naturally, his attention was turned in this direction. He wooed the genius of the place. This was not anything extraordinarily clever. It was in the air. He is entitled to credit for having abiding faith in the future of his country and of steel, and for risking with his young companions not only all he had, which was little or nothing, but all they could induce timid bankers to lend them from time to time. He and his partners built mills and furnaces, and finally owned a large concern making millions yearly. This son and his partners looked ahead. They visited other lands and noted conditions, and finally concluded that a large supply of raw materials was the key to permanent prosperity. Accordingly, they bought or leased many mines of iron ore, many thousands of acres of coal and of limestone, and also of natural gas territory, and at last had for many long years a full supply of all minerals required to produce iron and steel. This was sound policy, but it did not require genius, only intelligent study, foresight, and good judgment to see that. They did not produce these minerals. They saw them lying around open for sale at prices that are now deemed only nominal. Much of the wealth of the concern came from these minerals, which were once the public property of the community, and were easily secured by this fortunate son and his partners upon trifling royalties. Their venture was made profitable by the demand for their products, iron and steel, from expanding population engaged in settling a new continent. Without new populous communities far and near, no millionairedom was possible for them. The increasing population was always the important factor in their success. Why should the nation be denied participation in the results when the gatherers cease to gather and a division has to be made? The third son was attracted to Chicago and quite naturally became an employee in a meatpacking concern, in which he soon made himself indispensable. A small interest in the business was finally won by him, and he rose in due time to millionairedom. Just as the population of the country swelled, if Chicago today and our country generally had only the population of early days, there could have been no great fortune for the third son. Here, as before, it was the magnitude of the business based solely upon the wants of the population that swelled the yearly profits and produced prodigious fortunes. The fourth son, attracted by the stories of Hecula and Calumet and other rich mines, which far surpassed the wealth of Ormus or of Ind, settled in Montana, and was lucky after some years of rude experience. His ventures gave him the coveted millionairedom. The amount of copper and silver required by the teeming population of the country and other lands kept prices high, and hence his enormous profits mined from the land for which only a trifle was paid to the general government not so long ago. He did not create his wealth. He only dug it out of the mine as the demands of the people gave value to the previously worthless stones. Here especially, we cannot but feel that the people who created the value should share the dividends when these must pass into other hands. The fifth son had a melancholy career. He settled in New York City while young and unfortunately began his labors in a stockbroker's office where he soon became absorbed in the fluctuations of the exchange, while his fond mother proudly announced to all she met that he was in business. From this, the step was easy to taking chances with his small earnings. His gambling adventures proved successful. It was an era of rising values, and he soon acquired wealth without increasing values. For speculation is the parasite of business, feeding upon values, creating none. A few years and the feverish life of the gamester told upon him. He was led into a scheme to corner a certain stock, and, as was to have been expected, he found that men who will conspire to entrap others will not hesitate to deceive their partners upon occasion if sure it will pay and is safe from exposure. He ended his life by his own hand. His end serves to keep his brothers resolute 
in the resolve never to gamble. The speculator seldom leaves a millionaire's fortune, unless he breaks down or passes away when his ventures are momentarily successful. In such a case, his ill-gotten gold should be levied upon by the state at the highest rate of all, even beyond that imposed upon real estate values. Wealth is often, we may say generally, accumulated in such manner as benefits the nation in the process. Here it demoralizes the getter as well as the people and lowers the standard of ethics. It is taken without returning any valid consideration and ranks with gamblers' games. End of section 11 of The Empire of Business by Andrew Carnegie. Recording by Tom Carroll.